Hello everyone, today I have a commentary about Star Trek of all things, and particularly focused on this guy. This is Tom Paris in Voyager, or Nicholas Locarno from The Next Generation, and the real plot twist is, it's the same character. But my aim is on talking less about copycat characters and more about compelling characters and clever writing, and I just felt like using the Star Trek series as an example. Often some of the most compelling characters in a story are demonized or overlooked. This is very much the case with, say, Boromir from Lord of the Rings, but that'd be a commentary for another day. I'm also going to keep this commentary user-friendly in my analysis and description of the subject matter so that you don't have to be a Trekkie to be able to follow along. So, Star Trek Voyager is similar in spirit to the original series. There's a captain with a looming, irritable doctor over their shoulders. There's a logical Vulcan character. The two helmsmen are buddies and are like the middle-ranked officers of the ship. Both shows are exploration-based. For you visual learners wanting additional Trek info, I found this chart. It's a chronological display of what years the shows and movies take place and what years they were actually made slash distributed. You'll notice three of the installments take place at roughly the same time, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager. Anyways, during the course of The Next Generation, Season 5, Episode 19, The First Duty, which aired in 1992, had this random one-off character named Nicholas Locarno, played by Robert McNeil. The episode focuses on Will Wheaton's character, Wesley Crusher, and we all know how fun those episodes are. Basically, Wesley is apart from the Enterprise training at Starfleet, where he should have been and stayed to begin with, and Wesley and his posse of cadet buddies are facing this court-martial regarding the death of a fellow cadet, the plot of the episode is oddly reminiscent of the plot of A Few Good Men in some ways, which is interesting because that movie also came out in 1992. Anyways though, in the episode, Locarno is the head honcho of the West Side Posse, and also the most memorable of the four convicted cadets. Locarno is the squadron leader of the Federation pilots training the Academy. As a boast of skill, Locarno persuaded his crew to perform a daring flight maneuver. While training to do this, one of the crewmen is killed due to a flight accident. Big surprise. Locarno then persuades his crew to play dumb about what happened and what they were really trying to do with the dangerous flight maneuver thing in the hopes of not being punished. Eventually, throughout the vigorous trial, they get punished anyways, and Wesley Crusher feels it to be a good time to come clean and spill the fact that they were attempting some daring flight maneuver. Then, at the end of the episode, Picard explains that in some off-camera scene, Locarno came clean as well, and explained how he persuaded his crew to do the daring maneuver, and took full responsibility, and got expelled from the Academy, but his crew gets to stay on, ultimately meaning Wesley Crusher still gets to have plots. Yay! Okay, so let's get to the Voyager aspect of all this. Now, somewhere along the way, regarding the inception of Star Trek Voyager, somebody had an idea to carry along some random Starfleet cadet with a chip on his shoulder from the Next Generation episode and have him be like a very integral focus and to the plot of the spin-off series, which is Star Trek Voyager, which is just some phenomenal writing in my opinion. Like, truly how you should do a spin-off show, However, most spin-off shows pull recurring characters from the already existent show and give them their own show. But to pull source material utilizing a character from some random episode of The Next Generation, that's impressive and sort of genius. I mean, some wayward distressed writer strung along a whole spin-off series based on a one-episode appearance character? I mean, that'd be like if Game of Thrones made a spin-off series based on Benjen Stark or Serial Pharrell or something. Now, if you think kicking off a spin-off show using some dude named Nicholas Locarno from The Next Generation was crazy, this next part is crazier. So originally, the writers of Voyager had planned to use the character Nicholas Locarno for their show. But due to the fact that they'd have to pay royalties to the writer of that Next Generation episode who created the character Nicholas Locarno, the writers of Voyager made a complete rip-off character using the same guy with an identical backstory for their show. Try to follow this train of thought. Essentially, they replaced the character with the same character under a different name using the same actor. So, 
The pilot of Star Trek Voyager is about this select group of Starfleet rebels named the Marquis, and how they're fighting this group called the Cardassians, and through one of their altercations this one vessel gets intercepted by this giant space wave teleporter thing that takes them to the other end of the galaxy. Then Captain Janeway of the Voyager vessel needs to recruit a former member of the Marquis to help track the, the missing Marquis vessel. So she calls upon Nicholas Locarno, or, uh, sorry, I mean, his, his name's Tom Paris now. You see, after Locarno, or Paris's unfortunate leadership error, he is expelled from Starfleet. So to get back at them, he joins the Marquis, a group of Starfleet rebels. Then, on his very first mission with the Marquis, he is captured and thrown into the most pleasantly scenic Federation prison in New Zealand, apparently. So Janeway says to Paris that if he helps her find this Marquis ship, he'll be a redeemed man and free from prison. He does help for these obvious selfish reasons and to betray his former comrades and set himself free. But along the episode, when Voyager gets caught in the space wave teleporter thing and shot across the galaxy, the tone of Paris changes from selfishness to selflessness. I mean, now that he's on the other side of the galaxy, he doesn't really have any cause to behave one way or another. He could just be a belligerent asshole if he wanted to be. But when Crisis arises, he steps up to the plate, and we see his heart of gold. He assists the team with their investigation of the alien array and the alien world, and he even saves a fellow Starfleet officer, and saves his frenemy from the Marquis, Chakotay, a guy that initially he was gonna betray. On the whole, Nicholas Locarno, or Tom Paris or whatever his name is, is an interesting character study because he's given a chance at redemption for his crimes and bad life choices. Often redemption stories are some of the most interesting stories, because we've all done our share of sins and we've all fallen from grace at one point or another, albeit at varying levels of offense from person to person. But why do you think Darth Vader or Ellis Boyd Redding or Tom Paris here is so interesting? Because we feel for these characters and take pity onto these characters. Because they're human, and humans are complex and flawed. It's not that we're enamored by their crimes or misgivings, we're enamored by their compelling redemptions. Seeing them agonize about their bad choices and realizing they could still come around to make good ones. No matter if you're a foolhardy decision maker, a murderer, or even a lieutenant of an evil galactic empire, the tragic components of all these guys is within their vanity. By this I mean all of these characters were making a statement, trying to show off in some way, to raise attention to their actions. It's the vain nature of the human condition, to show yourself. Everybody wants to be known as somebody, and their actions defined who they became, for better or worse. The difference between characters or people who are revered for their accomplishments or revered for their flaws is in how they applied themselves. You know the quote, the road to hell is paved with good intentions? Well, it's very true. Nicholas Locarno, or Tom Paris, wanted to be an exceptional student at Starfleet and prove his quality and capability by doing some daring flight maneuver. In doing so, he got someone killed, and paid the price for it. Then, he became a Starfleet outlaw and paid the price for that. Finally, he was given a chance at redemption and seized the opportunity. And in the face of animosity and destruction, he rose to the occasion and redeemed himself. My complaint with The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and even Voyager is that the characters of all these stories are too wholehearted and not complex. Everybody on the team is for the team, and if any corruption or conceits occur, it's due to some space disease or some other character only appearing for one or two episodes. What made the original series such a great show was the complex nature of the characters, especially when you look at Captain Kirk. Kirk isn't always the ethereal hero of the Federation. On the contrary, he's quite the mischievous, conflicted leader. He has emotional outbursts as well as depth and real motivations. He breaks the Prime Directive like a thousand times and hates the Klingons and loves the ladies. He's passionate and pervasive, but also realistic and conflicted. He makes mistakes and has regrets, rethinks his actions and takes things to heart. Most of the characters in the Star Trek adaptations after the original series don't really possess this depth of character, so it's refreshing to see a character like Tom Paris be the central focus to the kickoff of a spin-off. 
arguably, Tom Paris could have been the main character, but for some reason the main character of every Star Trek show has to be the captain. I think it'd be refreshing to see an officer of the Federation be the lead of the show and not the leader of the Federation always taking the reins as the lead character. It's interesting to see the capabilities of a character in a story who is a subordinate or less capable to their superiors. They did it in the first Alien movie. Ripley wasn't the captain of the ship or a natural born warrior. She was just a member of the crew, but Alien was an amazing movie and I liked how they made the angle of the plot based around her and not the captain. In some ways it's more relatable because most people in the military or in any job or corporation aren't the leaders or the captains or the bosses. They're just people, cogs in the chain of command. The problem with a leader-focused story is that they often appear to be too infallible, and leaders often are leaders because of their capabilities, but they're also still human and make mistakes. The problem with the Star Trek spin-offs is that they all just seem too capable and too infallible, loyal cronies of the Federation. And yes, they occasionally make drastic decisions, they crash the ship, they break the Prime Directive, ooh, but never by their own hand. There's always reasons for their outbursts, there's always explanations as to why they had to make their drastic decision. I mean, there is an episode of the original series where Kirk sets off a self-destruct and is going to suicide himself and everybody on board because some aliens are hitching a ride to their homeworld and delaying Kirk's mission inconveniencing him, if you will. That's some illogical, hardcore, rash, emotional, maniac kind of decision-making, but it adds to the spice of Kirk's character. The reason everyone says the original series is the best is not because it was the original or the father of all Star Treks, but because it was good. It was raw, it had a real emotion. You really felt for these characters. You really would be devastated if Sulu or Uhura were to die, let alone Kirk, Spock, or Bones. Whereas in the spin-off shows, you couldn't care one way or the other if a character were to die. I mean, did anyone care when Tasha Yar was killed? No. And really, I wouldn't have cared if any of those guys had died, especially Wesley. I mean, I guess Picard was kind of interesting. I liked Odo. Quark was kind of quirky, but out of everyone springing from the spin-offs, I like Tom Paris and his story the best. My only wish would have been for more consistent writing backing him up the whole way through, but the essential key difference in my eyes between the original series and the rest of them is in the quality of the writing and the quality of the direction. I don't think that the actors of the spin-off shows were bad per se, but the writing isn't the best, and they're all too stiff and rigid, probably because the directors told them to be so and sci-fi vocabulary can be painfully boring. And because of all this, you don't really feel any realistic connection to these people in the spin-offs, and the image of Starfleet just became this elite militaristic place for the best and the brightest to dick around in space because everyone can relate to the most capable bourgeoisie within a story, right? I mean, how could a middle class or poor person relate to these guys? I sure couldn't, because they all felt and came off as elitists, and often infallible elitists at that. They don't seem flawed, they're the goody good of the galaxy and serve the ever so perfect valiant federation. The spin-offs portray the federation and everyone within it as this perfected socialist utopia. But in the original show, the Federation is quite flawed. The higher-ups are often corrupt or useless, as they often are and appear to be in real-life political and private sectors. The cogs of the Federation, like Kirk and his crew, don't seem elitist or infallible. They seem humble and human. They seem capable, but they also seem accessible, like you could pull up and have a conversation with any one of them on a human level. Not only were the spin-offs not as good, they became excessive and redundant. Yes, Trekkies, I'm looking at you guys. You can have too much of a good thing, and whether or not the Star Trek spin-offs are good is debatable. So viewers, particularly those of you who are Trekkies or like Star Trek, what do you think? Do you agree that the spin-offs oversaturated the genre of Star Trek and felt less relatable to people? Do you think that the original series was better for reasons? Yes, no? Why, why not? Share in the comment section below. For those of you still watching, I hope you enjoyed this commentary, and until then, I'll see you next time.